boy. Budge. 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 Welcome to Budge, Behavioural Science in Business, Education and Life. And welcome uh, Dr. Darren Coppin, uh, psychologist, uh, behavioural scientist, writer, speaker and of course uh, former Lionel Richie impersonator, which of course is not easy. Mm. Um, how are you sir? I'm very good. If I wasn't a speaker, these would be pretty boring. <laughs> um, yeah, and good to see you. Paul Miles, Managing Director of The Busy Group, one of Australia's largest education, training and employment organisations, who is also suspicious of cheese. <laughs> which I have. Budge is, um, Budge is all about uh, behavioural science, and nudge theory, and business education and life. And we, we've, we've you know, recorded podcasts on things like happiness and, and working from home. Uh, what we want to talk about today is the fact that why isn't nudge theory and behavioural science used more in the workplace and used more in business, given the amazing impact it can have? Before we do that, mate, you've identified five things that um, determine or, or define or characteristics of nudge theory and behavioural science. What, what were they? Well, first of all, small changes can lead to big gains. Nudges should be generally pretty small, but um, cheap and scalable. Um, we've got over 180 biases, and we can try and hack these biases to understand and predict how humans are behave better. Uh, but results have to be reviewed before we roll them out. And finally, uh, they've got to be um, easy to avoid. It's called libertarian paternalism, but um, they shouldn't be compulsory. Um, hmm. There shouldn't be a high cost for undertaking them. So behavioral science uh, is the ability to make small changes and kind of what you said, to make huge differences. And you would think this would be some of the most companies would want to jump on board. I'm going to, I'm going to warn you the start, because I always ask you examples as we go. So I'm probably going to say, lots of examples, please, Darren. What, what I found, you know, my organisation, the Busy Group, you know, we had about 150 staff a few years ago. We've got about 1,000 staff now. And, of course, as you grow, you're building process, you're building governance, you, you make sure that you operate effectively as a large organisation. Do we start to get nervous then about innovation and about using things of behavioural science? Is that one of the major reasons why companies don't use behavioural science to improve their businesses? Yes. The end. <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, if we take a business, it's a microcosm of of humankind and human behaviours uh, as a whole. It's highly competitive, there's social norming going on, um, there's, there's survival instincts dominating, um, and, and it's a place where um, everyone's risk adverse, generally, um, are trying to avoid standing out. Particularly, it seems, the bigger an organisation becomes, until you reach this tipping point when an organisation can then afford to take risks again. Right. They've got enough margin, or if they're a government, they've got enough um, budget. To... And something that Rory Sutherland, you know, is one of my favourite um, speakers on behavioural science, other than yourself, of course. Um, Rory talks about the fact that, um, you know, we, we are rewarded for not being risk-taken in companies, that, that effectively you're better off doing something rather average and it goes okay, they're doing something out there and it failing. Um, is that sort of the, that, that's kind of the fear that most people live with, they're actually scared within large companies to fail. Yeah, I mean, we, we have, um, we're risk adverse. And, and again, uh, if you, particularly if you're a public company, if you want to do something different to something you forecast a year or so before, um, then you've got to go through a huge rigmarole of, of doing something different and changing and adapting to changes in circumstances generally or tweaking budgets financially um, but we're driven by almost um, a drive to be average um, and, and most people think and I, was, I did a very prestigious MBA but then growing a business is about <laughs> <laughs> on, I'm not laughing. Online from <laughs> Nepal. Um, but <laughs> but the, you, you think that business and, and succeeding in business is about learning as much as you can about the competition, doing two by two matrices, budgeting for the next year or two, and trying to do what they do a little bit better. Whereas if you look at almost every successful business, every successful entrepreneur, it's almost ignoring that and doing what's on the margins, the, the, the very best or the very worst or the very most expensive or the biggest budget. And it's focusing on those niches and, and, and doing really well and exploiting and having a monopoly in a small niche. You, you think with the change in business in the last 20 years where we've seen lots of those long-term massive corporates sort of slowly demise, you know, Kodak's a great example, you know, and they've been so superseded by these new age tech companies. Like, they'd be superseded with by these new age tech companies, you know, Google and, 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 and Facebook and, and many others, um, Alibaba. So, 
you'd think that the, the use of innovation and behavioral science would actually have become the norm, yet we're still not doing it. Make, I, I'm going to throw it at you then. Can you give me some examples where people, have, companies have used behavioral science and they've broken the mold and they've actually managed to, to have great success with their business as opposed to, to companies that have continued to be risk averse? Well, it, it's not that behavioral science hasn't been adopted. We do it instinctively generally as humans, but marketing firms, advertising firms have been doing it forever basically okay uh, sorry explain that one to me well um, do we just not realize is that the whole point yeah the reason why supermarkets are set up the way they are with fresh produce at the beginning to give you an idea of well i'm buying healthy so i can splurge later or this place is a lovely fresh environment yeah and it's colorful and, and what have you it's the worst place to have them because they go at the bottom of the trolley and get squashed yeah but psychologically it's good and why you've got blue flecks in washing powder they do nothing really it makes us think they're better why why do as soon as you put eco in front of something that people think that it's actually much worse at performing its job um, and sales really? go down it is, so, so we don't <coughs> say when something's eco we don't say hey this is good for the environment we actually go oh that's probably not going to work as well as oh no we want to support chemicals. it but yeah we won't won't buy it necessarily <laughs> wow so and, and that's one of the biggest problems um, is is that being able to predict how humans behave is totally different to how humans say they're going to behave so one example is um, if, if you play, say you're in what we call in England a, a, um, an off-license or a bottle shop in Australia. I've been to England. Yes, and you've, I'm sure you've been to a bottle shop once or twice a day. Um, but uh, if you play uh, French music, um, uh, as opposed to German music, sales of French wine versus German wine, a, a triple. But if you then play German music in the background, sales of German wines are generally roughly three to one to French wines. Wow. Now, if you ask all those people that have been in that shop that day buying these wines, oh, and were you influenced by anything? The music, perhaps? 90% go, no, I just that's just what I wanted. So we're not aware, and we will say certain things, but the reality is um, actually very different. So what we're saying is to lift sales of Forex, we just need down under playing in every bottle shop in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> that's like the traditional Australian music, of course. Um, uh, the other reasons then we've talked about as to why we don't use behavioral science uh, in business. Uh, and I suppose the reason I'm, I'm, I'm so interested in this is I think behavioral science can lead to massive innovation and massive success as a business. Uh, we talked about that, that fear of um, uh, failure and, and taking risk. Flexibility, though, as well, you know, smaller companies can be more flexible uh, and can actually move quicker and try different things, whereas the larger you get, and I'm finding that with my organization, the larger we get, the harder it is to run small projects. Is that a key part of what you think of why we don't use behavioral science more in Yeah, in the there are world? several um, reasons, but um, one is um, budgets. Everything's so tight at the moment. You need the flexibility and, and the luxury of time and money to try something new out mm. rather than adjust slightly what you're already doing. Um, but the, the gains can be huge, and this is why when you do reach that tipping point and scale of a business, then they set up massive innovation departments like department x with alphabet google you know totally focus on moonshot projects uh, which are absolutely uh, are critical but um, moonshot, i love that phrase yeah. yeah but so you've got smes that are flexible responsive and generally run by an entrepreneur that's trying to think outside the square mm. or box this sorry we have to talk about this that you and i always thought it was the square and the australians had this phrase wrong but it's not it is actually think outside the square not think outside the box yeah from jp guilford's early 70s experiments with or or, or that almost an iq test where you've got nine dots and you've yeah. got to join all the dots up with four lines and you 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 could solve this couldn't you how did you do oh, it man, I, I did it in the old days i, I didn't do it the first time well, using you, your quill like, how did you uh <laughs> join them up you have to draw a line outside the box yeah exactly and that's where Square. the phrase comes from yeah. so it is it, yeah us problems say box um, and a lot of other people say square but that's it that 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 thinking and and Behavioural science, and, and there's almost two separate things we're talking about, is risk-taking and thinking and asking the silly questions and, and, and thinking of um, how can I solve this problem um, by coming up with how humans behave rather than tweaking my products and what have you. And of course, there are great gains to be have, had with um, uh, data analysis um, and big data. And they're not mutually exclusive, uh, being data driven and then being innovative and, and thinking of uh, really weird things. In fact, in your sector, one of the biggest predictors of someone dropping out of an apprenticeship 
is if somebody changes their phone number more than twice in a year, you should then, on their most recent phone number, phone them up and see what's going on in their life because they're highly likely to drop out. And that comes from data. But also, if you sit down and think about it, it's bloody obvious. But who has the time to sit there and ponder and think or ask the stupid question or the obvious question yeah, in a board meeting? Aside from losing, even when you lose your phone, you don't change your number. You change your number because there's something going on in your life. Hmm. It's a case of putting this stuff together, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, and it, it's there, um, but it's just the luxury of time and, and, and being risk-taking enough to, to, to just try and think a bit more differently. What, what does uh, Rory Suther- Sutherland call it? It's um, think psychologically. So just think a bit weird out, outside of just basic logic numbers and being run by accountants, consultants and, yeah. uh, and investors. Accountants. This kind of builds us then, you know, you, you come up with these five areas as to why... Um, uh, companies don't use behavioural science more. We've talked about um, biases, we've talked about risk aversion, we've talked about flexibility for SMEs. Big companies, they're just their, their ability to make decisions. Yeah, they, they're geared for the ordinary and what's proven, yeah. really. And and there's this individual and, and almost corporate, you know, you've heard the phrase FOMO, fear of missing yeah. out. There's a fear of standing out. And generally, as a human, we want to be unique, but not a freak. You know, so we, we, we want to stand out or be individualistic, but we, yeah. we've got comfort in the crowd. And it also comes back to that old phrase, you know, you never get fired for buying IBM or yes. you know, the, the, yeah. that, that sort of phrase. So, so we're, we're dealing against that. And it, and it really is the, the security and the freedom that you have to feel and the confidence in yourself and your job to be able to be risk taking suggests something really weird. Because as we've said before, you never know what's going to work and what isn't. And yeah. just as much won't work as it's will work. It's also a negative work. connotation, isn't it? Or he or she's a risk taker. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And, and you do need that. But, uh, and it's good if you've got one person that's a leader or a driver. But quite often that comes from lack of direct logic, this psycho logic. So um, uh, what's his name? The guy with, in Apple that, that stuck, drove that... Steve. Steve Jobs. Yeah, so he's, you know, it's said that his driver was his abject phobia against buttons and things that sort of dangle. Um, so he drove against not having buttons on a Blackberry or a phone. Um, if you look at when he did go, gives his speeches, he becomes more confident in himself and his business. He wears things with no buttons yeah, on them clothes. and what have you. Yeah. And he always wanted to drive towards um, gadgets being having no wires and being wireless and it was this crazy phobia driving innovation now if you did uh, market research on what people want market research being the fifth thing you've raised yeah. why businesses don't do this but, yeah. yeah and it's that thing you know consumers what they do and what they say is, is completely different and you've written Red Bull talk to me about this so, so Red Bull um, the market research would tell us and, and again I think we, we have to sort of talk about Rory Sutherland at this point I, I love my Red Bull but it tastes awful doesn't it and I, <laughs> I have no idea why but this notion that if you if you put something in a small can, but um, but sell it by saying, oh, can't have more than one or two in a day, and it's quite risky, uh, Red Bull defies all the market research. Yeah, we've got a massive loss aversion bias, a scarcity bias. We, we, we want something that's scarce. But with Red Bull, if you, and they did indeed do market research, let's test the size, let's test the taste. It, it, it scores terribly. Um, and But when you, when you put it together and you think, well, the size is that because it's so powerful, mm. it has to be in a smaller smaller jug uh-huh. right. then then that's why people think oh you know there's a scarcity thing there I, I, you know and it's in its worth worth getting so it's um and and the, and the you know it makes you gives you wings and makes you last longer at night uh in nightclubs for example dancing um <laughs> so you know the, there are there are benefits there but what it's playing on is the non-obvious market research big business logic what makes it so successful in a multi-billion dollar business is going against logic and operating on the fringes. But how can a company even try and do that? that? That sounds so hard for a company to achieve, to have that that ability to think like that. Yeah, I mean, Red Bull existed in, in Thailand. It was yeah. um, sort of un- uncovered or, or, or the potential seen by an Austrian guy. Mm. And, and, and it, it's just seen that oft, often the best things and the most successful innovations around us are happy accidents. Most business, 99% of business are striving for the ordinary. You know, even, even the, the alco pops and having mixers in thing comes from an over 
harvest of uh, of lemons in South I, Australia yes, and what this. have you. So it's all these accidents that, that drive it. So sometimes it's an accident. How do you nurture that in business? How do you nurture this risk taking and risk adverse, budget adverse um, environment? It's difficult um, and it's just as a as a leader you have to have the personality to give people freedom to mm. suggest stupid things so before we wrap up makes i i've got you have a plane to catch and a, i'm going to ask you in a minute for either a couple of examples or a couple of things that companies could do to adopt behavioral science and why what are the best ways they could do about it um mate you come up with these five things basically biases risk aversion SME's flexibility, big company decision making and market research, which does all come to the fact that large companies have to create an environment where it's okay to fail, where it's okay to try new things and actually create the resources and the time to do that. A couple of pieces of advice for all the CEOs and business leaders out there on, on why and how they can best adopt behavioral science. Well, I think it's just recognizing that that this is what exists, the, the, the norms and, and, and the human biases drive us into a compact, boring, competition focus but risk adverse uh, manner and that's not not what's going to turn you into a unicorn <laughs> that sounded weird <laughs> in, yeah. in a business sense um, it's just cultivate a culture of, of coming up with silly ideas and having spending what is it Rory Sublin says you know if, if he's if he's driven one key outcome it's trying to get people in ball meetings to spend 10 minutes discussing silly stuff and, and and asking the silly and the obvious questions to come up with real solutions that work play to us rather than always trying to change your product changing someone's mind is often cheaper but much more impactful and am I really throwing you under the bus if I ask you for the best example that you've seen of behavioural science and edge theory in my world of education, employment, apprenticeships and training? Mm. Well, a lot of people tried it, for example, trying to have um, like Apple stores as um, and you using that, that openness and, and what in have employment you. Employment services. In yeah. employment services. And it's just not necessarily it appropriate. Work, it? No, and you know, not having a receptionist so people don't feel that there's a gatekeeper. Mm. But what happens instead is people wandering and feel unwelcomed mm. and, and alienated and awkward and, and, and drop out. So there are examples of, of, of what hasn't worked. I know teaching um, employment service people to be compassionate and not empathetic. Uh, actually um, drives proactivity in job seekers and reduces burnout in, in staff. L little things like that, applications of, uh, of behavioural science in your sector. Thank you, sir. As always, it's a pleasure, mate. Um, uh, thank you for everything. Uh, I will let you go and get your flight. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for watching. If you liked what you're listening to or watching, then please throw us a like or a subscribe or a follow on YouTube or whichever podcast platform you're listening on. Uh, thank you for watching.